This video is about how to challenge overpowered player characters. Now, as a dungeon master, I like to give out loot with random tables. I like to let them roll for loot because then it's a bit of a mystery. For me, I get excited, they get excited, we all, we all get excited. Except one time, they didn't just get excited, and the players got overpowered. Because they rolled that double zero number, the hundred, on the loot table, which means they got loot that was way higher than their level should have allowed. They ended up with a Wand of Hold monster. And then, in the boss battle for the next session, when they fought a Basilisk, they went... Zippity zap, Mr. Basilisk, you are paralyzed. And then they just like hacked it to pieces. It was brutal and the encounter was meant to be tough and they just completely trivialized it because they were too powerful. So that got me thinking about, hey, how am I going to challenge these overpowered characters? Just quickly from the editing room, because I forgot to say this when I was filming, this video is mainly dealing with overpowered characters in combat. However, there are instances where overpowered characters can use their powerful abilities to bypass narrative challenges. For example, a character that can cast Fly and completely bypass your Hedge Maze session and kind of dissolve some of that drama, which isn't so fun. So I have a PDF on Patreon right now that you can get for five bucks. You get everything that I've ever made on Patreon just for five bucks. This PDF covers how to identify those problems where players' abilities might skip challenges that you have in your game, and then how to address that problem in a way that preserves the drama of your challenge and respects the player's agency in the choices they've made for their character abilities. So get it right now on Patreon. Back to the video. Let's go. So what does it mean to be overpowered in Dungeons & Dragons? Now, there are a few synonyms here. You could say, what does it mean to be OP? What does it mean to be min-maxed, right? What does it mean to be a munchkin? And I don't know where munchkin comes from. Does anybody know? Leave a comment if you know where munchkin comes from as a term. So all of these mean someone that is overpowered. So in Dungeons & Dragons, here's the point. It is essentially a combat game. A combat game, a tactical combat game. And that tactical combat game has rules, right? It has a rigid action economy. So if we're playing on the grid, we have rules that say you can only do so much every turn. You have limits on how far you can move, right? You have limits on the fact that you can do an action, a bonus action, uh, a reaction, right? It has expectations of what a character can accomplish within the, the rules of the game. And being overpowered means that you are exceeding those expectations. I've surmised that a character's power level, their effectiveness in combat, is based off their class abilities, right? Their items and their gear. And also the player's tactics, because some people are just... <laughs> some people are overpowered. Oh, but Matt, it's not, I'm not overpowered, I'm just really effective in combat, right? I like being effective. Why are you trying to take this away from me? Well, it can be bad in a couple of different ways. Because I found personally that a sure sign that the characters are overpowered is when they blitz through challenges that you wouldn't expect them to blitz through. And this can have two negative effects. If the players trivialize too many of your challenges, it is going to undercut your drama, right? You have a big boss battle that you're super excited about them struggling with and having so many clutch moments and they cheese it somehow and, and just obliterate it. That, I don't know, that can be really underwhelming. And the second way it can be bad is if you have one character that is way more powerful or way more strategic um, than the rest of the party, then that person can kind of steal the spotlight sometimes and take away opportunities from the other characters, because if they blitz the entire encounter with their ridiculous supercharged fireball that they finagled somehow, um, then the other characters don't get a chance to, to shine in combat, and that can be kind of frustrating sometimes for those other players. So before we get into the strategies to deal with specific scenarios with overpowered characters, I want to talk about an important concept here that's going to help frame your understanding of being overpowered, and that is balance in Dungeons & Dragons, because, well, let me draw a diagram. The point that I'm going to try and illustrate here is that balance in Dungeons & Dragons is not always a clean subject, okay? It's, it's always in flux. It's actually quite messy. So I want you to imagine two buildings with a tightrope between them, okay? Two buildings with a tightrope between them. Look at this beautiful illustration. Uh, so we're going to look at two tightrope walkers. Now, the first guy, this fella, he walks across and he's got the big pole, you know, and he's super balanced. He doesn't even shudder at all. He doesn't wobble this way, doesn't wobble that way. He just walks away, all the way across, perfectly balanced, perfectly centered, and then he walks walks back. 
and there's no problem, absolutely expert. People would say, dude, that guy has perfect balance. But then there's this other fella. Oh my God, I don't know how this guy got up there. Who let this person on the tightrope? This guy, he walks over without a stick. And he gets on there and he kind of stumbles this way and he's going, whoa. And he, he kind of nearly wobbles off over there and he goes, whoa. And he barely catches himself over here. There's a lot of drama. There's a lot of drama in this YouTube video. He gets over here and he goes, oh, I'm going to die. It's certainly, I should tell my wife and kid, why have I done this? I should have taken out life insurance. They were right. And, and he, but he barely makes it over here. And then on the way back, he even gets down on all fours and it just crawls back. You know, it's embarrassing. He's embarrassed himself. But he makes it all the way across. He doesn't fall. Now, I would say that both of these people are balanced, right? Because balance is described in this scenario by not falling over. And sure, maybe the, the guy in green with the big stick is more balanced, but Boolean style, yes or no, are they balanced? Yes, yes, they are. So even though those two didn't look the same when they went across, one guy didn't have to make any adjustments as he went across. The other guy made plenty of visible adjustments as he went across both were balanced, okay? Balance doesn't always have to look the same. It's a broader spectrum um, of balance. Now check this out. I want to illustrate the broad spectrum of balance in Dungeons & Dragons. So at different levels, the characters, different character classes, are going to hit different power levels, okay? They have like a different kind of rhythm. So for example, um, I don't know if this is true, I don't know if this is exact, but imagine when the Barbarian hits level 5, okay? That's when they get their multi-attack. Okay, and compared to everybody else, like maybe the, the wizards and stuff, maybe he gets like a massive power boost at that point. So he's most powerful at level five. But imagine the druid. So at second level, maybe she gets her, her wild shape ability, which is like a massive power boost. So maybe druids um, at level two are, are super duper powerful in comparison to all the other characters. And even though maybe, hypothetically, barbarians are more powerful than any other character at level 5, and maybe druids are more powerful than any other character at level 2, there's kind of a, a rhythm to them, you know? Some of the classes hit their power spikes at different beats, and that's okay. That's still balanced. Here's another scenario. Imagine one of your players has specialized in something. They've said, I really want to be the most convincing and charming character out there. Or maybe like a rogue specializes in finding and disarming traps. And you think to yourself, ah, I've got this very powerful trap in the dungeon. It's going to be so cool when they come to this, this locked door and they, they all get blasted by this dramatic trap that, that shrinks them or something, right? Um, but then your rogue goes, oh, I'm, I'm big into traps. I'm going to disarm it, right? And they succeed on their impossible role because they've specialized so hard. You know, just because they accomplished an impossible task um, doesn't mean that it's overpowered. They just specialized in this. That's okay. They're better at this skill than every other character out there, even other rogues, because they specialized in that. That's still balanced. And another important thing about balance that you should remember is that Dungeons & Dragons is stacked in the player's favor. One of my friends, Josh, the dreaded GM from Twitch, uh, he used the phrase, we're the big damn heroes. I was like, yeah, we are the big damn heroes. <laughs> um, the combat system, the story, the, the very conceit of the, of the game is that, hey, things are stacked in our favor. We're the players. Uh, we're controlling the narrative. We are the main characters and we're probably going to win. And the balance in the game is skewed towards that. They're going to be tougher than monsters usually. And you're going to be on their side as well. You're their dungeon master. You're their friend. You're barracking for them, I hope. Um, so it's okay if they win. Mate, they're the players. So now let's talk about how to overcome a overpowered character. Um, and the first way to do that in any kind of instance is to ask yourself this simple question. Is it even a problem? I mean, are your players so powerful that it's disrupting the game or making some other players unhappy? Because if the answer is, well, no, it's not disrupting the game and we're actually okay with it, then hey, maybe it's it's fine to be powerful. It's okay for the players to be powerful. Um, but if you ask yourself that question, is it really a problem? And you go, yes, it is. A, it's a big problem. I can't sleep. Uh, then hey, let me help you out. First, let's look at the scenario of one character being more powerful than all the other characters in the party. So imagine this chart, okay? Here are all the players, okay? And this, their height determines their power level, okay? That's the party. But then there's one fella. There's one fella who's just super, he's way more powerful. So if you're trying to challenge that party, I want you to imagine that you've got water, okay? And this is the level of water. That's the level of challenge. 
that this the rest of the party can handle without drowning, without being overwhelmed and just losing all the time. But this guy is just trivializing it. He's never in any danger, and in fact, he's so big he can drink all that water. But then, if you were to go, okay, fine, I'll challenge, I'll challenge that character, then the rest of the party is getting overwhelmed, right? And that kind of um, dissonance, that difference there, that can be a problem. So the broad solution that I'm looking at here is a way to kind of put a handicap on this character, right? So we're going to find a way to challenge this character without disrupting the fun of the other player characters. And to do that, we're going to put a handicap on it. So imagine this is a swimming pool, but when it gets to this character, he's actually standing on a more difficult platform. So even though he's such a strategic person, he's actually facing the same level of difficulty, right? Is this a good diagram? I feel like I lost the plot. Okay, but we'll keep going. This is fine. Every Dungeon Master has these three tools in their Dungeon Master tool belt that they can use to challenge an overpowered character without overwhelming the other player characters. And those three tools are tactics, situations, and nerfs. So let's talk about tactics. This will rely on you knowing the rules of Dungeons & Dragons quite well well to be able to use the system against an overpowered character and you're going to be you're going to be cheesy as all hell right every single class has some kind of weakness so let's look at the barbarian for example right there's a barbarian and he's specced into armor class so much and he's got so much hit points that you just can't deal with him you're never going to drop him so you have to change your tactics a little bit so if the barbarian has incredibly high armor class right and you're never going to hit them then instead I want you to hit them with saving throws, right? Maybe maybe you're never going to hit them with an attack roll, but hey, that wisdom save is pretty low. You could probably charm person. You could probably charm person him, and, and then he's not going to be able to dodge that, my friend. But also, barbarians have another key weakness. They are not particularly mobile. They cannot fly. So if you throw flyers at a barbarian, if you throw flyers at a barbarian, um, then they're not going to be able to get into melee range. For example, the design of the barbarian class is... If I am fighting you one-on-one -on -one and I'm in your face, then I win. No matter what. You can throw a barbarian one-on-one -on -one against any character, against any class, against any monster, and the barbarian's going to do pretty well. But if you throw a lot of minions at the barbarian, they struggle. They don't have splash damage, right? If you throw saving throws at the barbarian, they're going to struggle. If you throw flies at the barbarian, they don't have the movement to be able to get into that close range. So this is a way that you can employ tactics to challenge an overpowered barbarian. And frankly, all the classes have similar weaknesses. For example, if you have, have if you have casters, right? Casters in your party that are doing cheesy stuff, then give your monsters counter spell, right? Done. Do any of you out there have ideas for other tactics to specifically challenge the other character classes? Let me know because I'm sure there is a way to challenge all of them. If you have a single character in your party who is completely specialized in murderizing everybody on the combat field, right? And they're just trivializing every fight and blasting everyone to all hell. Well, maybe you could change the situation. Does every combat have to be about eliminating every single combatant? You could have different combat goals. So maybe in this combat, it's not just about killing all of the, uh, all of the evildoers. It's we're in a boat and it's filling with water. And part of the combat is they have to bail out water all the time, right? So even though that character is very effective at killing people, all the other players still get to be useful by bailing out water or maybe... Maybe that powerful character isn't even helping the situation by killing people. He should be helping to bail out water. Maybe a combat happens with a timer. So it's not just about killing the, the, the enemies very fast. Maybe they have to, as a puzzle, they have to kill the enemies in particular zones of the map. Like they have to kill an enemy in this square, that square, this square. So it's about moving the enemies around and forcing their movement into the correct spaces so they can complete the puzzle. It's not just about killing them. Or lastly, maybe there's an avalanche coming down the mountain and we're in combat here and the goal isn't to kill everybody, the goal is to escape the oncoming avalanche without getting blasted by the enemies, right? So these, these are different situations that kind of take the wind out of the sails of somebody that is completely specced into murdering <laughs> your combat encounters. Just change the situation. This tool is a little bit controversial. This is the power of nerfs. When you nerf something, you're making it less powerful. You're kind of taking the juice out of the player's powerful engine. A lot of people don't like this, but here's an example. When I gave my players that wand of hold monster that trivialized my basilisk boss fight, well, I said to the players immediately after, hey, that wand's 
pretty powerful. Like, I think we're going to have to dial back the numbers a little bit. And the players agreed. Like, they were okay with it. I wasn't taking away their cool bit of treasure that they found. I was just changing the way it worked a little bit. And what we ended up doing was, like, taking the difficulty, the DC that the, the monsters had to make to resist this spell. I took it down from a 17 to, like, a 13 or something. And then later, I took the charges down from 10 to, like, to like 3, Right? And they were still getting to have the effect of like every every session, they could still hold monster something. Um, it was just less likely to succeed. I didn't take away their cool loot and the players were all fine with it. And this kind of comes back to that example of the tightrope walkers. Just because I'm adjusting the balance of the game doesn't mean it's unbalanced. One person walks across, it doesn't change a thing. Other person walks across and wobbles this way and that way. They're both balanced. Just because I'm changing the balance of the game as we go, um, like it's, it's still it's still fine. Like I'm not being unfair to the players, I feel. And sometimes players will even self-identify this kind of thing. For example, one of my bards found this dragon mask. I can't draw a mask, right? They found this dragon mask and it was perfect for a charisma based character. The dungeon master did not expect us to win a particular fight, um, but we won it and we got this loot when the villain was meant to escape. So we had this powerful endgame artifact at the start of the game. Now it would make complete sense for my bard to take that and just be super powered. But the barbarian is the one that got the kill on the, um, on the villain. So we all said, oh no, the barbarian can have it. Because we all knew, we didn't even talk about it. We all knew that if my bard got that mask, I would be way too powerful for the rest of the group. So we gave it to the the barbarian and he got like advantage on charisma modifiers on charisma rolls or something um it didn't affect any of his spell casting or anything because he can't do it um and we were all okay with that right our goal wasn't to become as powerful as we could we self-nerfed and i think that good players do that but it's not always going to be a, just a single character in your party that is too powerful. Maybe you've got an entire SWAT team of munchkins. The party has coordinated their abilities and their choices and their dice rolls or whatever and their tactics. And they are just obliterating every single challenge you throw at them no matter what. So how are you going to deal with that? The good thing here is that if the party is overpowered as a whole, then you can just treat them like they're higher levels. So if you're throwing, I don't know, griffins at them and they're going, we don't give a crap about griffins, I eat griffins for breakfast. But the, the book says, oh, griffins are an appropriate challenge for this level of party. Then what you start doing is you just go, okay, cool. I'm going to start throwing dragons at you. Have fun. And maybe, maybe then the players, maybe they'll be challenged. So if you want to increase the difficulty for your party, right, you have a few opportunities, a few options. The first is that you could do tougher monsters look at this guy he's so tough you just throw higher level monsters at them too easy um another way thing you could do is that you could throw modified monsters at them maybe they have crazy abilities that you wouldn't expect a good way to do this to make your encounters more deadly is to lower the health of your monsters but then increase the damage that they do the players will go down a lot more and the last way that you can increase the difficulty of your encounters is to throw multiple monsters at them right? Ooh, that's a tough encounter. <laughs> because the way the action economy works in 5th edition is that in general, the side of the combatants that has more people, has more combatants on their team, they're more likely to win because they have more actions. They have more opportunities to crit. But there's another consideration you've got to make when you're increasing the difficulty of your encounters. And that's what kind of story are you telling? Because D&D typically breaks down into four tiers of play, right? Four tiers of play. The first tier is like the first five levels and it's gritty fantasy. It's that mud and blood style where, hey, the players are probably going to go down in a hit. They don't have a lot of hit points, you know? Life's rough for a level one character. The second tier of play is heroic fantasy where the characters are well known, they can hold themselves up and they can accomplish these kind of heroic deeds. They can really affect the world at this point. The third tier of play is that crouching tiger, hidden dragon style, where the kind of feats that they're performing in combat, they're, they're pretty impressive, you know? The regular person sometimes can't even comprehend the things that they're doing, and they are going and doing these globetrotting adventures. Um, the fourth tier of play would be like, 
they're superheroes. At level 20, they are essentially superpowers. They have superpowers and the world is at their whim and mercy. The thing I'm saying you should take into consideration here is that when you throw more powerful enemies at the players, then suddenly you might be telling a different kind of story. You might be expecting to tell a gritty fantasy story, but because of the threats you're throwing at them, oh, it doesn't make sense anymore. We're going to have to slip into heroic fantasy and the themes of your games might change. So try and be a little bit reflective of where your party is sitting in the tiers of play and the kind of level of story that you're telling and the way that your challenges that you're throwing at the party correspond to that. From a player perspective, and this might seem stupid, I love, I love being overpowered. It's so fun. When I play a video game and it's like a Final Fantasy game, it has appropriate challenges that it's throwing at you. It expects you to be able to accomplish so much or whatever. I'm the kind of nerd that will just park myself in the chair and grind for like 50 minutes, <laughs> just leveling up in the first area so that when I get to the first boss, it, it goes, you're meant to lose this fight. And I just try and obliterate it. I'm like, I'm grinding you for 9999. <laughs> I love being overpowered in games. So I completely see the appeal that some players are chasing. Everybody, thank you so much for checking out this video. This was suggested by my mate Platy. Thanks for support on Patreon, Platy. All my patrons, they are downstairs. Thank you for the support, patrons. And I just want to let you know that I'm having a really nice time. I'm having a really nice time making videos for you. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. Hey, um, subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. Like the video. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>